All right, so the respiratory system, the respiratory tract, really begins at the nasal cavity. You know, so in the evolved natural way for us to breathe, air first enters the body <clears throat> through the nose, through the nares of the nose, and then travels through the nasal cavity. Now, of course, <clears throat> you know, we can breathe through our mouths, and we do sometimes, um, you know, when our nasal cavity is clogged with sticky mucus or um, <clears throat> when we're talking, sometimes when we're um, uh, moving a lot of air, like in exercise, we'll open our mouths because there's less resistance to airflow that way. Um, but <clears throat> the, the best way to breathe is, is through your nose because the nasal cavity, and you remember, the nasal cavity extends further back than our can our conscious perception understands, you know, so like here's your eyeball right here. The nasal cavity actually extends behind the level of your eyes. So it almost goes back to the middle of your skull from the side. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this big box shaped cavity. And as air passes through that cavity, it gets um, conditioned. And by conditioned, I mean it gets warmed and humidified. All right. And that warmth all right, and filter as well. So the warmth and humidity comes from putting air next to blood because blood is warm and blood has a lot of water in it. <clears throat> so what we have is if you look at this section of the skull right here, so this is kind of a weird, you know, slice, but we've taken the face off essentially and we're looking at the back two thirds of the skull from the front. Okay, so here are the eye sockets right here. This is the nasal cavity. This is what we're talking about. And you can see that there are these spiral shaped, um, uh, they sort of stick out into this box. So if this is the box, what you don't see here is the three-dimensional shape of it. So these things are called conchi, all right? C-O-N-C-H-A. A concha is one of them. Concha is plural. Okay, we have three pairs of these. So we have a superior one, we have a middle one, and then we have an, an inferior one. Okay, so the superior concha is here. Here's the middle. Here's the inferior. Now air travels around this complex shape, and because this is anything but smooth. And, and straight, in fact, it's curvy and wavy, it means that as air passes through these complicated shapes, it has to slow down, okay? So the air slows as it wafts around these nooks and crannies and bends. And then in addition, the, um, these conchi are lined with a thick mucosa. So a, a layer of epithelial cells with blood vessels underneath. So as the air wafts past that slowly and non-uniformly, in other words, not in a nice straight line, but kind of bending and twisting, heat and air, or heat and water go into the air that's passing through these structures right here. So the air that leaves the back of your nasal cavity is significantly different than the air that entered your nostrils, all right? It's much warmer, it's about body temperature, and it's much more humid, about 100% humidity. All right, so when we're breathing through our noses, we get that benefit. And air on the way out, the opposite happens. Okay, so air coming from your lungs is, has a very high humidity and very high heat. Well, as it passes back over this mucosa, that heat is reabsorbed, the fluid is reabsorbed, so what comes out of your nostrils is quite a bit cooler, than body temperature, and it's quite a bit less humid than body temperature. Now, it works better going in than it does going out, as you see on a day like today outside. You know, if you watch somebody breathe, you see these plumes of, of water vapor coming out, either the nose or the mouth. That's water coming from the body, leaving in the air, because we can't regain all that water that we put into the air in our lungs and the nasal cavity. Okay, so. The nose is not just there to hang up to hold onto your glasses. It's also an apparatus for humidifying and warming the air. And you get a sense of this. You know, if you um, uh, do uh, exercise on a cold day like this, 
your throat may get very dry, right? You know, you feel that dryness, and it's because you're not humidifying the air when you're breathing through your mouth. Plus, on a cold day like um, today, um, the, the air has a tendency to be very dry because cold air can't hold much moisture. So you take this very dry, cold air and you breathe it in, and your body just gets, the, the fluid gets pulled out of your respiratory tract. So you end up losing a lot of water on a cold day like this, yes. So it's, what happens when it's humid out, like hot and humid? It's just the opposite. The air has so much water in it that um, it's usually more comfortable to exercise, but you can't sweat out your heat when it's humid. Mm -hmm. So you end up hot and, you know, kind of sticky feeling. Mm -hmm. So the opposite effect happens. Incidentally, it's why one of the reasons you get more colds in the wintertime is not because the viruses are affected by the temperature. It's because the, as air gets colder, it gets drier. Dry air dries out the mucous membranes and makes viruses have an easier time getting into your system in the first place. So just as a, a, an aside, one of the best ways to stay healthy over the winter is run a humidifier in your house or in your bedroom all the time, from the time it gets below, you know, about 40 until it warms back up above 40. Because, you know, we take air from outside and we heat it up to stay warm, but we ha if we haven't added any water to it, that air is going to steal water from wherever it can. And you are probably the wettest thing in your house, okay? <laughs> so um, it's going to take that water out of the mucous membranes. All right. So the conchi swirl that air around. And you can see that, okay, so this, this is the, uh, the conchi. These spaces, like right here, this is where the air is passing. See how they're a little darker? It's because they're empty. And you can see that these aren't very big air spaces. So this structure also explains why when you have nasal congestion, why sometimes you cannot get air through your nose. And it's because these little passageways get clogged with sticky mucus, and you know you can blow as hard as you can, and it's not going to move because it's too sticky. So it also explains that. So even though when we look at the nose, we see these two big holes, you know, and you think, well, how can that get clogged? Well, behind those two big holes are these little tiny nooks and crannies where air has to pass. All right. And then the last thing that the nasal cavity does is it filters the air. So we talked about the mucociliary escalator last time. Well, particulates get filtered in the nasal cavity even before they get down to the rest of the um, respiratory tract. Evolutionarily, this makes sense because it's easier to get mucus out of the nasal cavity than it is out of the lungs, for example. You know, in the lungs, you've got to cough it out. In the nasal cavity, you can blow it out, right? So it's a little easier to clear, to clean the filter. So when you blow your nose, you're cleaning the filter. Incidentally, that's also why we have hairs that guard the entrance to the nose, too. Now, they're not getting rid of microscopic debris. They're keeping out larger things. Probably the, one of the principal reasons we evolved these is to keep bugs out of our nose, right? Because the hairs would not only keep the bug from getting in, but identify to you or notify you rather quickly that something is crawling up your nose, right? Because hairs are very sensitive. Okay. So nasal cavity, not just there to hold your glasses up. Okay, <clears throat> so ultimately the upper respiratory system is, you know, here are the, the, the proper name for the nostrils are the nares, the nares or nares, so that's here. The vestibule is the part of the nose directly above the, um, the nares. Behind that we have the nasal cavity, superior, middle, and inferior conchi from the last slide. We also have internal nares. So remember, you've got one of these on both sides. It's a symmetric thing. Okay, so you're looking at the central wall here that divides. The nasal cavity is divided into a left and a right, and there's no it doesn't there's no holes in between unless you've got a problem with your nasal septum. So in the back, you've got a hole on both sides, left and right, where air is going to then exit the nasal cavity down into the pharynx. So we call that the internal nares. This is the, um, the pharyngeal tonsil. Remember we talked about the adenoids in the last chapter? Well, this is what this guy is right here. So air comes by, it hits this, and then it goes back down. So the part of the pharynx, this is all pharynx, 
that is behind the nasal cavity. This is the nasopharynx, right? Here's the oropharynx behind the, the mouth, the oral cavity. And then here is the laryngopharynx behind the, um, the larynx, which is right here. So we have three parts to the pharynx. We're going to talk more about the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx in the digestive tract when we look at swallowing and how all of these structures have to move around when we go to swallow something to get food or drink from here past the airway opening here into the esophagus here to go um, on its way down. And like I said last time, note that the airway is in the front and the esophagus is in the back. It's posterior. Okay, so the larynx is a very complicated structure, and it's far more complicated than we need to worry about right now. Okay, so instead of having you know all of this anatomy, I've indicated what I want you to know down here. Okay, so I want you to know the three main cartilages and then um, the, uh, the vocal cords. But what you're looking at, this is the, the cartilage and connective tissue that makes up this part of the neck that we commonly refer to as the Adam's apple right, or the voice box. So in the front, the most prominent thing you see is the thyroid cartilage, which is right here. So it's kind of shield-shaped. It's broad. It has a point in the front. Um, typically, it's larger in males than it is in females. And that's not the only reason that vocal cone is different. Um, it's males just have a larger um, larynx than females do. So they have a more prominent Adam's apple. The laryngeal prominence, which is right here, is what you'd point to as the Adam's apple. If you had to use one finger to point, that's where you'd point, is the laryngeal prominence. And because there's airway behind there, people do not like to have this area of their neck messed with much, right? Even when you poke on your own, it's like your body's like, cut that out, right? It's because <laughs> there's an airway in there that it's trying to protect. Um, so we have that big cartilage, the thyroid cartilage. Next one down is called the cricoid cartilage. And if you're careful, you can palpate it too. It stands out as kind of a, a thick ring underneath your thyroid cartilage. It is the technical beginning of the trachea. And the trachea is a tube that goes down into the lungs, um, or down into the chest, and eventually to the lungs. All right, so those... The thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage um, and the epiglottis are the third, is the third cartilage I want you to know. The epiglottis you can't feel from the outside. Sometimes you can see it in a person whose mouth is very wide open, particularly if they're making some kind of vocalization. And it looks like a thumb that sticks up from the very back of the throat. The easiest place to see this is in a really, really angry infant. Because then you can kind of look and say, oh, look at that. There's the epiglottis. Um, so it sits there at the back, sticks up like a thumb. So if we take this um, larynx and we turn it on its side and look at it from the side, that's where you see the epiglottis best. So it's right here. And the epiglottis, and here's another picture of it now from the, you're looking at it from the front. <clears throat> the epiglottis is kind of like a trap door that protects the airway when we swallow. Okay, so this is the epiglottis right here. When you swallow, this is flexible. Okay, so the, the rest of the cartilages are kind of rigid and plasticky. The epiglottis is more rubbery. So when you swallow, it bends. It goes like this, and it blocks the, the top of the larynx as food or drink goes towards the back. Right? So it's a pretty slick little involved design. <clears throat> so when we swallow, this gets pushed down. And that covers the airway and keeps things from going down the wrong pipe, as we sometimes say. All right, so epiglottis is there. <clears throat> Inside the thyroid cartilage, so right here, okay, remember that's this region right here from the side. We have these two folds of tissue that cross from the front to the back and essentially cross right over the opening of this, um, of this structure. Because remember, you know, this, this is all open down the middle. But the vocal ligament here and the vestibular ligament here actually cross the lumen of this tube. So when we add back in the soft tissues, it looks like this. All right, so this is kind of a weird view, but it's a view that many of you are going to see in your life when 
you are trying to put a breathing tube down somebody's uh, trachea. So what we're looking at here is the, the larynx from the top. All right, so this person, we've got their mouth open, and they're kind of sitting like this, like that. And you're looking down this right here. Okay, so we're looking right here from, from the mouth. So like this is the view. All right, and what we see there, we see the epiglottis sticking up. This is, so the patient's front is down here. Okay, so this is anterior. This is posterior. We're looking down. So we see the epiglottis sticking up at us. Here's the back of the uh, larynx, so this is the posterior side, and these are those ligaments that cross the lumen, right? So this is the lumen, this is where air is going to flow down. Crossing that from front to back, we have the vocal folds, okay? And the vocal folds are, um, there's a ligament in there, very tough, but kind of like a guitar string. It's flexible, but it's strong. And then attached to that vocal fold on both sides, we have this <clears throat> area of tissue called the vestibular fold. And there are muscles attached to this system that allow these two vocal folds to open and close, right? And I've got a, I've got a great movie to show you in a minute, but you'll see this. Anybody watch the movie already? Okay, good. This is a good one. All right. <clears throat> so these open and close. So this is closed. So <clears throat> say you're swallowing. You know, you're taking a drink and you're swallowing. As you swallow, you know, we all know we can't breathe and swallow at the same time. Well, this is why we can't. Because when we swallow, the vocal folds snap shut and seal off our airway until the swallowing reflex is complete. Okay? So these swing shut and air is blocked. Now, by closing the vocal folds like this <clears throat> and then pushing air in between these, that's how we make our voice. So just like a reed instrument, you know, like a clarinet or something, you know, you, you blow across the reed and it vibrates. Well, when we blow air through this opening, the vocal folds vibrate and create the sound that then we shape into our voice or into our, yeah, into our voice or into our speech. Okay, so it's a two, it works for two things. Protects the airway by closing when we swallow but it also is the principal way that we make sound. Now, when we whistle, we don't use this. We use, our, we use more like a wind instrument. But for our talking, we use kind of a reed or a string instrument blowing air through this. Okay. So the sound that you get as these things vibrate, we call that phonation. Okay, so there's two parts to speech. There's phonation and there's articulation. Phonation is the creation of sound. Articulation is taking that sound and shaping it into words or singing or something like that. All right. So um, <clears throat> if you like hum with your mouth open, like ah, uh, that's phonation. It doesn't sound like much, right? You have to then shape that sound for anybody to get any information from you. Okay. So let us look at the vocal cords in action. All right. Hey, come back here. Yes. Is um, if someone is aspirating, is that like a is that um? It can be many on? different things. One cause of that is the vocal folds are not closing. Um, another cause can be the epiglottis is not blocking, and that system, while it works ninety nine percent of the time, all of us have experienced food or drink going down the wrong pipe. So, you know, if you get distracted during swallowing sometimes or you go to laugh and the vocal cords open and everything gets jacked up. But if somebody's having chronic aspiration, it's usually a swallowing problem. You know, something is not closing off the airway like it should. Yeah. And I've heard this might not be true, but like if someone gets intubated that their vocal cords can be damaged, is that true? Or yes, if somebody doesn't know what they're doing. <coughs> yeah, I'll show you this picture. <coughs> the vocal folds are very touchy. So when you go to intubate somebody, this is, you're trying to put the tube right here, right between the vocal folds. And in some people, you know, let's say you, this is the first time you've done it and you kind of bump the side with the tube. When you bump this, sometimes the vocal folds will slam shut on you. And if you try to push the tube through, you can end up damaging the vocal cords, which is what you're talking about. 
Okay, so this is what we call a, um, a, a laryngoscopy. So we're going to look at the larynx um, and the voice box happening in real time. Okay, so <clears throat> looks just like the picture we just saw, right? So here's the front of the patient. There's the back of the patient. Here are the vocal folds. Here are the vestibular folds. This opening, we call that the glottis. Okay, so the glottis is the opening between the vocal folds. And this lady's going to sing for us. She's not a very good singer. <laughs> but we do get to see her vocal cords. All right. So it's vibrating. Breath. Watch the breaths. And she's going to breathe. See how it opens? And now she's going to take her a higher note. And we'll see this a couple more times. She's going to breathe. So this is the epiglottis down here. You can't see it very well, but... Now you just got a real good view of there. So that big thing. I told you she wasn't very good. <laughs> So the higher the note, the tighter the vocal cords have to be. So the low notes, you see how they go floppy, 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 that's a low note. Right. Um, it depends on if she's breathing in or out. So when she's singing, air is coming towards you through the vocal cords, making them shake. When she takes a breath, they spread, air comes, goes back down into her lungs, and then she's ready to do another note. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you're sick, can you lose your voice? Why, why do you lose your voice? <clears throat> because the vocal folds, um, when, you, when you lose your voice, the vocal folds are irritated, mm -hmm. so they don't vibrate right. They're kind of stiff mm -hmm. or even boggy because they're, they're, they're swollen. So you try to blow air through, and it just there's no sound. It makes very little sound. So you have that raspy voice of the air coming out, but not the, the vibration. Good question. Is she able to swallow with that tube down her throat? Oh, she doesn't have a tube down her throat. They're looking at, I should have explained that. They're looking at this through her nose. Oh. Okay, so what they did is they took a camera, they put it in here, down here, floated it around here, and they're looking here. With a with a fiber optic camera. Could be, could be. Another approach to looking at the vocal cords is with a mirror. We don't do that as much anymore. But you have somebody say ah, and you put a mirror, angled mirror like this at the back, and then you can bounce the light and see it. Yeah. The typical way is you use a blade. Um, it's a real simple device. It, it has a, a long end like this that's kind of flat and round like that. And then there's a handle that you hold. <clears throat> so this goes in on top of the tongue. And you, you put the patient's head like this. They open their mouth. You push their tongue flat with this blade. So you pull towards yourself. And you don't rotate. They'll teach you that. That's how you break teeth. So you just pull down. And that pushes all of this tissue flat. And then you look straight down into the into the um, glottis, and you thread the tube through. Particularly challenging in little tiny babies. I've done lots and lots of that because their their vocal their whole vocal apparatus is only about that big. So you use a very tiny tube, and you just go like that. <laughs> All right. So vocal folds in action. Okay. That was the most exciting part of the day, yes. Um, so people have different tones and pitches uh -huh. in the voice. Does that have to do with the size of the vocal cords? Yes, principally. So like one of the reasons that the female voice is higher than the male voice is your vocal cords are shorter. So just like a guitar string, you know, in a lot of instruments, you'll see that the higher strings are, um, well, what is it? It's, yeah, it's the higher strings are shorter. Same kind of thing. There's also a tension part of it, too. The female vocal cords are have more tension to them naturally than the male cords do. It's why even inside the genders you have sopranos and altos. Same thing. It's size of vocal cords and it's tension of those cords. Yeah, and it also puts the limits on the human voice. You know, you you 
uh, a soprano can't sing bass, right? The physics isn't there. The vocal cords are not shaped like that. Yeah. So you can't like teach your vocal cords to become higher. You can. You can extend your range. So and that's through practice. Essentially, you work out the muscles that tense that cord, um, and you you can extend your range. But you know, a, a bass is never going to sing soprano. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what about someone that's mute? Can you, like how does does that happen? Mute comes from lots of different things. Okay. Usually mute is a neurologic problem. Okay. It's the, in other words, the voice box is formed properly, but the brain doesn't use it right. Yeah. And the most common cause of muteness is deafness. Mm -hmm. And it's because if you've never heard sound, your brain doesn't understand how to make it. You know what I mean? Now, people who are deaf can learn to talk, but it's usually you can tell. And it's because how they don't they can't hear themselves, so they don't have any way of controlling the shape of their own sound, except by feel, which is how they learn to do it. Other questions? The voice, right? Now you know how it works. All right. Okay, so moving down into the less exciting and and uh, screen ready or screen spectacular parts of the system. All right, this is where we just were. So cricoid cartilage sits underneath there. The trachea is literally a tube of cartilage. And probably the feature that you need to know most about it is its cross-sectional shape. So when you look down at the trachea, it is not round. It is C-shaped or D-shaped, depending on who you ask. Okay. So th this wall, the rounded wall, is rigid which you can feel if you go further down your neck and poke around. You feel it, okay? It's good to poke back. The back part, though, <clears throat> is flexible. Flexible. There we go. Um, which means that the front of the trachea always has the same shape, but the back of the trachea can change shape. And the reason for that is behind, this is front, okay? Front. Behind the trachea is the esophagus. So as we swallow, the esophagus expands and then contracts as something passes through it, right? Imagine, you know, you take an egg and you put it in a flexible hose. Well, it has to expand as you push the egg through it. Same thing happens to the esophagus. So like when we swallow, the esophagus pushes on the back wall of the trachea and pushes it forward a little bit. Um, now, it, it's never enough to block the airway or anything, but there is a change. And the reason, there's a reason why this is rigid. If the trachea isn't rigid enough, because of how we breathe, which we're going to get into later, if every time we took a breath, the trachea would actually collapse if it wasn't for the cartilage rings that keep it open. Um, and it's it, because as we breathe in, we drop the pressure in our chest and that would cause the trachea to get squeezed shut by the atmosphere if it wasn't for these rigid rings that are in there. So the air tubes, unlike arteries and veins, air tubes have a, a, an infrastructure that holds them open all the time until you get to the tiniest air tubes, which are bronchioles. Okay. When you choke on something, is it because it goes down the wrong pipe, or is it because it's like too big to swallow? No, if it shouldn't be that it's too big to swallow. It's that it's gone down the airway. That's choking. At least the can't breathe choking. Now, if you try to swallow something that's too big, your esophagus can kind of get in a knot, but that's not going to stop you from breathing. So choking happens either because you've got food here blocking something, mm -hmm. or more commonly, you've got food here or down into here somewhere. All right. So the trachea comes down. It splits into the left and right primary bronchus that goes to the left and right lungs. And this spot right here, which I keep forgetting to put a label on, but this spot where it divides has a special name. And it's called the carina. All right, I'm going to put that on the board. Every once in a while, your book will miss something of huge clinical significance. And it's probably in another picture, but this is one you have to know. Okay. 
So the trachea comes down and it splits right into right and left. This spot right here, where it divides, we call that the carina with a C. And the reason I make a big point about it is clinically, in other words, in taking care of patients, it's an important landmark that we look for on x-rays. Okay, when you take an x-ray of a person's chest, you can usually see the black trachea and then it splits. And this spot is easy to identify on an x-ray. And you know, we were talking about breathing tubes, putting a breathing tube down. Ideally, you want your breathing tube to be between about halfway between the clavicles and the carina. So you want it to be somewhere between here and here. So I want you to know that word because it's going to come up later in your life. For many of you anyway. All right. And then we go onward into the lungs. So essentially, <clears throat> the respiratory... <coughs> excuse me, speaking of respiratory, the... Um, the air tubes, the respiratory tract, is like an upside down tree. Okay, so you look at a tree, all this always comes in the winter time, so you can see them, right? It's got a trunk that comes up, and you've got limbs, and you've got branches, and you've got little tiny branches, right? Take the leaves away for now. Well, the respiratory tract looks like a tree in reverse. So the trunk is the trachea. And then you get limbs and branches and little branches and smaller and smaller branches. So in uh, the, br the primary bronchi, bronchus on each side, that's here and here. In our tree, we only have two big limbs. Okay, so the trunk goes up and splits into two. Kind of a boring tree because it's kind of one-dimensional. But So we have two primary bronchi, one on each side. And then the limb splits into smaller limbs, so we've got secondary bronchi, okay? Secondary bronchi go to lobes, so we also call them lobar bronchi. Um, the uh, left lung has two lobes, the right lung has three, so there's that many secondary bronchi. Okay, so on the left side, there are two secondary bronchi, like we see in our picture. On the right side, there are three, because there's three lobes. Then from secondary bronchi, we have even smaller limbs that we call tertiary bronchi. At this point, the, the appearance changes a bit. Okay, so do you see how the cartilage plates here are nice and round? You know, they look like a tube. By the time you get to the tertiary bronchi, they're not really tubes anymore. They're plates, you know, so they're like um, uh, plates of armor, you know, stuck on the sides of these tubes, but they don't go all the way around, like you see here. And then from tertiary bronchi, we get ever smaller branches until eventually we get to the bronchioles. The bronchioles are like um, the twigs, or even the, we'll call them twigs. The bark is not very thick on a twig, and the bark, so to speak, on the bronchioles is not very thick. They don't have any cartilage on their sides. They have sort of smooth walls. The bronchioles eventually divide out into terminal bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles are like the stems of the leaves, okay, the thinnest part that still looks like a branch. And then from there, we get the alveoli, which are the leaves, and we'll talk more about those later on. All right, so we have these, this branching system. Now, by the time we get to the bronchioles down here, instead of having tubes with, with cartilage plates, they really almost look like arteries, except they have air in them instead of blood. So there's some real similarities. So we have this wrinkled um, epithelium, just like we saw in arteries, remember? We have smooth muscle in the walls, just like arteries. It's just instead of blood, we've got air in here. Okay, so this is what a bronchial looks like. And bronchioles, unlike these larger tubes, they can actually change size. You know, so just like an artery can get bigger and smaller, the bronchioles can also get bigger and smaller, depending on what the body needs from them. Um, and to just give you a little clinical relevance, asthma is a problem that occurs at the bronchioles, because the bronchioles can get smaller, and in asthma, they get smaller when they shouldn't get smaller. So it, it increases the work of breathing 
and can sometimes lead to respiratory distress, as many of you will have heard. Yes? What's the difference between an exercise-induced asthma and asthma? They both affect the bronchioles. It's the cause that's different. So exercise-induced asthma is the body is responding opposite to what it should. It should be that as your exercise level goes up, these bronchioles should get bigger so that more air can get down in there. In exercise-induced asthma, they either don't get bigger at all or they actually get smaller. So you, we, you got to give a little medicine in advance. In classic asthma, the bronchioles are, they act like they're inflamed all the time. So they act like they're infected even though they're not. So they stay kind of boggy, and they're too small. Um, asthma is either an autoimmune disease, or it's an allergic problem. So it's either the body is responding inappropriately to itself, or to something in the environment. The latter is the most common. You know, so most asthma has an allergic component to it. Um, some, well, it's not really asthma when people call it asthma. It's, it's bronchiolitis or, or uh, bronchial. Um, inflammation happens if these bronchioles are too small to begin with. This happens in new, uh, babies that are very, born very prematurely. Their lungs don't really form exactly right. And for the first five to seven years, their bronchioles are too small. Eventually, they grow into them. Eventually, they do get bigger. But it's in that first time that they have trouble. All right. So see the tree? Saddle so looks like an upside down tree. So, you know, here's the trunk, we've got our two limbs, and then um, <clears throat> here you see the lobes, all right? So here's a lobe, so there's three lobes on the right, one, two, three, two lobes on the left, one, two. So the right, it's easy to see the lobe. So here's a secondary bronchus and its branches going to the top, the superior lobe. Here is the middle lobe, this is where it gets a little more murky. It's not that it's inaccurate, it's you're, they're showing you three-dimensional thing in a two-dimensional space. So you're getting a lot of overlap in this picture. But the only reason it's really there is to show you the, the tree pattern, that we go smaller and smaller and smaller. And the reason it looks like a tree is because our lungs, in many ways, have the same task as a tree has. You know, a tree has to get access to air and light. Our lungs don't have to do that. But our lungs do have to get access to lots and lots of air. So same structure evolved. You know, it's, it's that's, we call that convergent evolution, where you see same pattern in two very different organisms. All right, better view of the lobes. <clears throat> um, so this is, we're seeing, looking at it from the sides. So oftentimes, you know, we as human beings, we are three-dimensional creatures, but we think in two dimensions. And it's particularly in this day and age, because we see so darn many pictures of things, you know, and pictures are flat, even though the world is not flat. Okay, so, you know, when we look at a human being, uh-oh, I'm drawing again, all right, <laughs> and we see lungs, right? Well, our brains kind of trick us into thinking that lungs are kind of flat, or at least that they're left and right organs. You know, we got a left lung and a right lung. And that really isn't true. Lungs are more front and back organs. So if we take our human being and we cut them in half, the center, okay, this is the mediastinum, which should sound familiar, right? So that's the heart and the great vessels. But in our chest, this is all lung and this is all lung. So in terms of where is the, the, the volume of the lungs, it's in our anterior to posterior um, width. So the lungs are wide and skinny. They're wide front to back, skinny left to right, which is not how we think of it because of all the pictures we've seen. But you can see that in these, in these uh, diagrams. So this is from the side. So we have, if, we, if, you, if you look at a person from the side, that's how big their lungs are. The left and right part is much, much narrower. Okay, so the right lung has its three lobes, right? Superior, middle, and inferior, which means it has two fissures that divide the lobes. We've got a horizontal fissure, okay? Horizontal because it, it's on level with the horizon when we're standing in anatomic position. And the oblique, or yeah, the oblique fissure 
separates the superior and middle from the inferior. So it cuts all the way across like that. On the left side, we have a, a superior lobe and an inferior lobe and one fissure, an oblique fissure. So a rare example in the human body of an asymmetry, right? We saw some in the great vessels, you know, how we have a brachiocephalic artery on one side but not the other. Well, here's another one. The left lung has one less lobe than the right lung does. The reason for that, um, remember me talking about how our, our front to back distance got smaller? We got more oval this way instead of oval this way like most animals are. Well, as that happened, you know, we got flatter front to back, probably so we could do better climbing trees. Okay, it's probably a primate thing. But that meant that the heart had to rotate. Remember how I talked about the heart had to rotate? Well, <clears throat> as it rotated to the left, there was no longer room for all three lobes on the left side. So the reason that the left lung has one fewer lobe than the right is because it shares the chest with the heart. So the, the space where the third lobe would have been is taken up by our left rotated heart that takes up that space instead. All right, so <clears throat> three lobes, two lobes. Apex is just the top, base is just the bottom. Okay, so that's all good anatomy to know. All right, now, on, uh, on this, let's see, does it talk about these things? Okay, now we're looking at the middle side. So we've taken the lungs out, we've flipped them around, and first we see this is the most striking feature. This is the hilum. The hilum is where stuff goes in and out of the lungs. So we got three things going in and out. We got air going in, okay, from the pulmonary or from the um, primary bronchus. They're in brown, all right, so this is the airway going in. This is the airway going in. And then we have arteries going into the lungs and veins coming out. Okay, so we have the pulmonary artery on both sides. Here's one, here's one. And then we have pulmonary veins coming out of the lungs on both sides. And there again, you see that they're not symmetric. They're not mirror images of each other. And it's because of the way the heart is shifted to the left, the vessels come out a little bit differently too. But you do see there's two pulmonary veins and one pulmonary artery, two pulmonary veins, one pulmonary artery. That matches what you hopefully remember about the heart. Remember the left atrium has four holes, right? I said that's the easiest way to identify the left atrium. Here is where those four holes hook up to, the four pulmonary veins. So um, there's a superior and inferior on both sides. And now on the right, they're more front and back. But one, two, three, four are those four holes. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Um, <clears throat> so you, you should know the contents of the hilum. You know, you may see this picture right here, okay? Um, and be, keep your orientation, all right? So this is posterior, this is anterior. Um, there are clues. You don't need to know the indentation. So like, see how it says groove for the aorta? I'm not gonna test you on that, but it is a good hint because you, the aorta comes down on the left side of the body in the chest. And that means that if you see an aorta shaped groove, that's a left lung you're looking at. If you didn't already know that because of the big cardiac notch, which is right here, the cardiac impression. Okay, so left and right lungs. And um, in lab, um, tell, uh, and I'll try to remember to tell Will this too, um, I can get you lungs out so you can see them, okay? So you can lay eyes on them and hold them, human lungs. And we can inflate them too, which is a super cool thing to see how the lungs blow up like balloons. So I will uh, get with you on that. Okay, some questions. Functions of the nasal cavity, other than holding glasses up, are which of these?
Ten seconds, jump in. All right, so the best answer there is E. If you're coughing through your nose, you're not doing it right. <laughs> right? Um, so it does not act as a dampening chamber, but all those other things it does. Filtering, humidifying, warming, we talked about. Resonating chamber, if you've ever noticed how somebody's voice changes when their nose is all sucked up, or if you hold your nose and talk how you sound different, it's because the nasal cavity is one of our principal resonating chambers that distinguishes our voice from others. All right. The portion of the pharynx that receives both air and food. So what's the shared part? Two of those are made up. Don't get ever tricked by the made up ones. Okay? If you have to guess, guess what the word you've heard before, not a word you haven't. <laughs> All right, just a few seconds, so jump in. If you haven't. Could nobody picked up the made up words? Okay. <laughs> B is the best answer. The oropharynx is the part that's shared. Now, could you say that it's C, the laryngopharynx? Well, you can make an argument there, depending on how you define it. But it certainly is not E, because air and food does not belong in the nose. All right. One more. The gladius is which of those things? You'd be surprised what children will put up with. So sometimes you have to give that lesson to children about how only air goes in your nose. Yes? I have a question about that, the food and air thing. I have a lab puppy at home, and he gets really excited to eat, so when he eats, I can like hear him breathing too. How does he not get food down his... Like he eats and like within like sixty seconds. Oh yeah, dogs are infamous for fast eating, and, and they don't like, they don't chew like we do. Their stomach doesn't, so they don't have to. Um, yeah. he's still coordinating his his breathing with his swallowing. It's just so funny to hear him like eat within thirty seconds, but or sixty seconds, but he's still yeah. like breathing super hard. Because they have the down. same crossed airway digestive tract that we do. In other words, air has to go towards the front and food has to go towards the back. So he's just coordinating it. And even if if it goes down the wrong way, they just you know, and that's it and they've cleared it. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, best answer, we're out of time. But the glottis is the opening, okay? It's the, oh, not to the, to the larynx. Sorry, I didn't see that. Two openings. Glottis is the opening to the larynx. That's its way down into the trachea. All right, folks, that's it. We're out of time. I kept you one extra minute. I'll pay you back another day, I promise.